Hi guys, it is another blustery, windy day here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here on this soon-to-be-rainy Wednesday, October 31st, 2018. Halloween is upon us, and for today's Chronicle of the Collapse, we're going to read uh, an essay from a fellow I admit I, I was not aware of until yesterday, and I want to thank this excellent website, Undenial, that's un-denial.com. I highly suggest you check out this excellent website. <coughs> Anyone interested in collapse needs to check out Undenial. At any rate, they put out an, an essay by this fellow, Peter Watts. Peter Watts, as I say, I've not heard of this gentleman until yesterday. He is a combination uh, marine biologist and dystopian science fiction writer. Uh, if anyone should have a background in what is going on on this planet, would be that combination. I have emailed Peter to see if he would be interested in an interview here on Collapse Chronicles. I'm waiting for his reply. But in the meantime, I am going to share this essay by Peter called The Adorable Optimism of the IPCC. So this is Peter weighing in on the uh, this latest IPCC report, the adorably optimistic one. And uh, now I do want to make, since this is Collapse Chronicles and not that other channel, I do want to put out an F bomb warning. Uh, Peter is a fan of the F word. So if you cannot handle a few F bombs, you probably do not want to listen to this and you might not be prepared to what's coming down the pike if an occasional F bomb here and there is enough to to rattle you. Uh, <coughs> so anyway, you've been warned. I am going to put the link to this story on uh, here. I'll give you the link. I suggest you read this to yourself, <coughs> but uh, if you just wanted me to sit down and read it for you, I'll be happy to do that. And here we go. The Adorable Optimism of the IPCC. <coughs> Take it away, Peter. People have noticed I get it in pubs and emails and from one disapproving professor at Concordia who, clearly regretting having invited me into her classroom, asked, So, why do you even get out of bed in the morning? Erwan Perchok, I'm not quite sure who Erwan is, Erwan Perchok asked me a few weeks ago, you once described yourself as an angry optimist. Is that still true? And as I guess this is Peter answering this question, <clears throat> those questions. Perhaps the tone of my writing has changed over the years. It was always what some insist on calling dark, but perhaps the shadows have deepened. Even a dozen years ago, the backdrop of my stories, not the plot or the theme, mind you, just the context in which the story took place, might have been described as a forlorn fire alarm. Jesus Christ, people, can't you see the cliff we're heading for? We have to hit the brakes. Now, though, well, in recent years, I've written at least three stories with happy endings. And the reason those endings are happy is because they end in murder and massacre. <clears throat> it's not that I've given up hope 
entirely, but perhaps my narrative emphasis has shifted away from avoid the cliff and closer to make the fuckers pay. Hope dims as time runs out, anger builds, and now nearly a hundred world-class scientists throw a report at our feet that proves something I have recognized intellectually for years, although not so consistently in my gut. I've been just as childlessly, delusionally optimistic as the rest of you. Bear with me, though. Read on. I have at least one more happy ending in me. It's been a couple of weeks now since the IPCC report came out. You know what it says. If the whole damn species pulls together in a concerted effort without historical precedent, if we start right now and never let up on the throttle, we just might be able to swing the needle back from catastrophe to mere disaster. If we cut carbon emissions by half over the next decade, eliminate them entirely by 2050, if the species cuts its meat and dairy consumption by 90%, if we invent new unicorn technologies for sucking carbon back out of the atmosphere, or scale up extant prototype tech by a factor of two million in two years, if we commit to these and other equally Herculean tasks, then we might just barely be able to keep global temperatures from rising more than one and a half degrees C. We'll only have 70 to 90 percent of the world's remaining coral reefs, which are already down by about 50 percent. Let's not forget, I'm sorry, we will only lose under one and a half degrees. We will only lose 70 to 90 percent of the world's remaining coral reefs, which are already down by about 50 percent. Only 350 million more urban dwellers will be exposed to severe drought and deadly heat events. Only 130 to 140 million people will be inundated. Global fire frequency will only increase by 38 percent. Fish stocks in low latitudes will be irreparably hammered, but it might be possible to save the higher latitude populations. We'll only lose a third of the permafrost. You get the idea. We have 12 years to show results. <laughs> if, if we don't pull all these things off, if, for example, we only succeed in meeting the flaccid two degree C aspirations of the Paris Accord, then we lose all the coral. We lose the West Antarctic Ice Sheet and the Greenland Ice Shelf. Not that it isn't already circling the bowl, of course. Twice as many people will suffer aggravated water scarcity than at one and a half degrees. One hundred seventy percent more of the population deals with fluvial flooding. The increase in global wildfire frequency passes sixty percent and keeps on going. <clears throat> Marine fisheries crash pole to pole the number of species that lose at least half their traditional habitats is two to three times higher than would have been the case at one and a half degrees. It goes on. There 
is no real point in worrying about a measly two degree increase though because on our current trajectory we'll blow past three degrees by century's end. The Trump administration is predicting four degrees in a Celsius, otherwise known as seven degrees Fahrenheit. The Trump administration is, presented, is predicting four degrees, which is why they are so busy dismantling whatever pitiful carbon emission standards the U.S. had already put into place. What's the point of reducing profit margins if we're headed straight for perdition no matter what we do? We don't really know what will happen then. <coughs> Methane clathrates released from a melting Arctic could turn the place into Venus, for all I know. But you probably know all of this. You've had two weeks to internalize it. Time to recoil to internalize the numbers, to face facts to shrug from what I can see, to go back to squabbling over gender pronouns and whether science fiction has too many dystopias. <clears throat> Remember last year's New York Magazine article by David Wallace Wells? It came pretty close to outlining the fate we have made for ourselves closer than any bureaucrat or politician has ever dared. Remember the pile-on that happened in its wake? Activists and allies all decrying the story as hyperbolic and defeatist. Remember the hope police insisting that we had to inspire, not doomsay. Where are they now? One of them is Michael Mann, client science superstar. Back in 2017, he shat on Wallace Wells with everyone else. Quoting Mann, There is no need to overstate the evidence, especially when it feeds a paralyzing narrative of doom and hopelessness. Close quote. And now, here he is, just a few days ago, Admit, admitting that even this stark doomsday IPCC report is, quote, overly conservative, uh, according to man, that it understates the amount of warming that's already occurred. And man is still an optimist compared to, say, Professor Jim Bendell, who argues that society is bound for inevitable collapse just a decade down the road, and that we might as well start grieving now and avoid the rush. He even wrote up a paper to that effect, which I have read here on Collapse Chronicles, uh, but the policy journal he sent it to would not publish it until he rewrote it to be less disheartening. Still, optimistic or not, this latest report is unprecedented by IPCC standards. It effectively offers, as the TIE points out, a simple choice between collapse, I'm sorry, between catastrophe and disaster. It does, as a thoroughly vindicated Wallace Wells now proclaims, gives us permission to freak out. So, are we? Meaning, are we freaking out? In terms of media reaction, the usual suspects say the usual things. Big Think and Rolling Stone go straight down the middle, admit the Cytrep is dire, express doubts that we will do anything about it even now. David Suzuki? Well, zero points for guessing where David Suzuki comes down. The tech folks <coughs> 
are talking about geoengineering again. The Guardian talks about food over at Medium. Daniel Estrada tries <coughs> really hard to put a good spin on it to work within the timeline of the IPCC report and the U.S. election cycle to explore ways in which we might achieve the merely disastrous best case. And then, halfway through, he admits that he doesn't really think any of it will happen and that this is merely a hopeful thought experiment and in his heart of heart, he thinks we are all well and truly fucked. Over there at the National Post, Canada's answer to Fox News, some idiot named Kelly McParland blames the activists for everything because they hectored and warned and complained for so long that who could blame the rest of us for tuning out? But perhaps the most telling reaction from the right wing comes courtesy of Petroshill Anthony Watts, who, unable to deal with the actual science, simply ran a cartoon showing IPCC authors whining for more money alongside a guest editorial suggesting that even if it is all true, it would be way cheaper to just give everyone air conditioners. Of course, none of these folks wield any actual power. What they all think doesn't matter. What about the people who actually call the shots? How have the world's leaders responded to this latest 10 alarm fire to this 12 year deadline? Well, when he wrote this a few days ago, Brazil was two days away and now Brazil has elected a far right reactionary who has promised to quit the Paris Accords once elected. That's Jair, Jair Bolsonaro who is now backtracked on that. Germany, a world leader in environmental issues not so long ago, reacted to the report with a profound, eh, Australia's energy minister demissed it as a distraction from the more important goal of lowering energy prices for Australians. Back in August, France's government's inaction on climate change, I'm sorry, France's environment minister resigned in disgust over his own government's inaction on climate change. That was before the report's release, but has Macron had a come-to-Jesus moment in the meantime? Here in Canada, provincial premiers are taking the feds to court over a measly carbon tax. The government itself permitted an emergency session right after the report came out. Parlam a parliamentary debate which, as far as I've been able to tell, accomplished exactly fuck all beyond one side of the aisle yelling, think the children, while the other side yelled, think the economy. And these are and these are the progressive jurisdictions. I probably don't have to tell you about Donald Trump's hilarious instinct for science, which apparently allows him to dismiss the IPCC's findings as biased, even as he makes clear that he doesn't actually know what the IPCC is. And what about the world's real leaders? The 0.01% who actually hand out the marching orders to these presidents and premiers and prime ministers. 
turns out they are retaining consultants to advise, to advise them on how to prevent their personal security forces from killing them once civilization has collapsed and their money is no good anymore. It seems to be a lot more than mere thought experiment to these people. Global societal collapse seems to be their default scenario. They call it the event. Why, it's almost as though they knew what was coming before the IPCC even tendered <clears throat> their report. To me, <clears throat> one of the most interesting facets of this whole clusterfuck is how eager everyone is to tell us that it's not our fault. <clears throat> This is quoting <clears throat> The Guardian. Neoliberalism has conned us into fighting climate change as individuals. Here is Naomi Klein, who in all fairness I've admired ever since No Logo, quote, Capitalism killed our climate momentum. Over its slate, Genevieve Gunther asks, who is the we and we are causing climate change and saves us the trouble by answering the question herself? <clears throat> Quoting Genevieve Gunther from Slate. <clears throat> Does it include the 735 million people who, according to the World Bank, live on less than $2 a day? Does it include the approximately five and a half billion people who, according to Oxfam, live on between two and ten dollars a day? Does it include the millions of people all over the world, 400,000 alone in the 2014 People's Climate March in New York City, doing whatever they can to lower their own emissions and counter the fossil fuel industry? Close quote. Gentleman quarter, Gentleman's Quarterly reassures us that, quote, billionaires are the leading cause of climate change. And I have lost count of the numbers of times I have read that a mere 100 companies are responsible for 71% of global carbon emissions, to which I say, bullshit. You are all to blame whether Naomi Klein wants to let you off the hook or not. Not that I'm denying uh, any of her arguments. They are all true. We were certainly told by supposed allies like Greenpeace and the Pergs, as well as more obviously nefarious corporations and governments, that if we all just recycled and, and ate one meat-free meal a week, we would be doing our part to save the planet while BP and the Koch brothers continue to rape the biosphere. Up here in Canada, the reigning liberals, for all their noble rhetoric about fighting climate change, are still buying pipelines and forcing tar sands down our throats and subsidizing big oil to the tune of over $3 billion a year. The conservative opposition in, in Canada won't even pay mealy mouth lip service to the issue. Down in the states, both main both mainstream parties are sticking or sucking too hard on the corporate teat to do anything that might actually endanger the profits of their owners. Individual actions cannot fix things. The very scale of the problem guarantees that institutional responses have always been necessary. All of this is true. But you know what, people? 
There were always alternatives. You could have voted for Sanders. You could have voted Green. You could have voted for Ralph Nader when he was running. Hell, am I the only one who remembers Jerry Brown's abortive run on the presidency back in 1980? I still remember his announcement, the three priorities he laid out for his administration. <coughs> Uh, I anyway, guys, uh, I obviously, uh, am running out of time. Uh, I would love to go on and on and on with this, but, uh, you will just have to go on the link and read it yourself from, uh, here on out. Uh... But he ends with uh, a somewhat tongue-in-cheek prediction of the United States invading Canada when uh, this whole thing comes down, uh, ending uh, with, with this final thought, being a Canadian, thinking about uh, the chances of the U.S. invading uh, as the collapse unfolds, finishing up with, maybe if Donald Trump has his way, they will be so busy eating each other, you know, down there in the U.S., that by the time they remember us, they will have too many self-inflicted wounds to do much about it. Maybe then we will have a fighting chance, or maybe they'll just leave us up here to die in peace a few decades further down the road. See, I told you I was not out of happy endings. <laughs> but anyway, uh, Amen, Brother Peter Watts. And as I say, I'll put the link on here and encourage you to uh, finish this uh, excellent essay yourself. And I'm sure you can find a lot of links to Peter's other essays and uh, dystopian uh, science fiction novels while you're at it. And as I say, uh, I invited... Peter last night to be interviewed here on Collapse Chronicles, and hopefully he will agree to do that. Anyway, I have, but I have got to get ready for uh, my next Collapse Chronicles interview with a fellow named Jerry Irwin, which uh, promises to be a lot of fun. Uh, so I got to get ready for that, and we're going to be posting that interview with Jerry Irwin on November 11th, on 11-11, so keep your eyes out for that. Enjoy the collapse while you still can. Bye, guys.